Hello everyone and welcome to the first medication regarding first medication first lecture about pain management. This one's going to focus on mostly talking about general pain medications and the different classes of drugs. Um, as you guys probably are well aware, there are lots of different applications to pain management and many, many different um, disease states that would require some form of pain management. So we're going to talk about pain management as more of a general discussion, not necessarily going through detailed algorithms and things like that. So a little different than what our general approach would be. And then there'll be a separate lecture on osteoarthritis and talking about pain options or management options for that. And we'll also touch base a little bit on things like chronic pain management and general acute pain management as well. Pain management isn't complicated on the surface level, but the more you look into it, the more tricky it becomes, the more restrictions you add to a patient. For example, if somebody can't take uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs, uh, it makes pain management options difficult to figure out where you're going to go. So we'll work through these different options and hopefully this will make a little bit more sense by the end of the lecture. This is a stepwise approach to pain management that I think works a little bit better than the WHO ladder I just showed you. So again, this can be sort of a roadmap for acute pain. I think they wrote this with the intention of talking about um, post-op neuro neurosurgical procedures. So you can kind of ignore that because I think it really applies to pretty much any aspect of pain management. Basically, you've got your non-opioids analgesics as your first step, and that's going to apply everywhere. And then you've got sort of the stepping stone of things considered weak opioids or partial opioid type drugs. Then you've got your regular opioids, so things would be like oxycodone or morphine. And then you've got some of the more advanced discussions of pain management, so things like nerve blocks, um, epidurals, pumps, um, spinal stimulators, things like that. And then, of course, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are usually recommended throughout the whole stepwise process, regardless as if you're on step one, which that might be the only thing you're taking. But the point is, is that we usually layer our pain medication. So if you are escalating somebody and prescribing opioids, it makes sense to recommend them taking a uh, non-opioid medication as well. You might be able to get some synergy out of that. So again, this will hopefully make more sense when we talk about the actual drugs, but use it as a little bit of a roadmap from an acute pain perspective and how we approach managing pain. So let's start with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs. Estimated that 17 million people use NSAIDs on a daily basis. So these are probably the most common pain management strategy employed across the world, and they work quite well. They're relatively safe, but they obviously don't come without any risks. Few drugs do. And uh, I've, I've heard and I've read studies on um, pain management, in especially in Europe and other countries, countries, uh, non-US countries, where they focus a lot more of their pain management strategies on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs versus the US, where we tend to go more with opioid-based management strategies, especially for acute pain. Probably pros and cons to each of that, which we can talk about here and leave it up to you to decide what you want to do from a practice perspective. But it is a little interesting to see what different places do in different parts of the world. So historically, uh, NSAIDs have been around for decades, and um, salicylates or aspirin-based derivatives weren't really uh, were really basically the only drugs until about 1950 when they tried to make some non-salicylate uh, attempts that were basically toxic. Sorry, a little confusing on that bullet point there. Change that. Um, indomethacin was the first relatively safe NSAID to hit the market, which was, I think, in the 1950s. I can't remember. But the point is, these drugs have been around a while, so we're, we're pretty familiar with how they work, and there's a lot of different ones. Technically, I think there's 20 different NSAIDs on the market. They have a bunch of different pharmacologic categories, but uh, essentially they all do mostly the same thing. There's a little bit of differences in how they target the different enzymes that they block, but essentially they all do the same thing. So their mechanism isn't going to vary a ton NSAID to NSAID. What is going to change 
is the way they're metabolized, um, SIP-related interactions, and their duration of activity. So there's long-acting versus short-acting NSAIDs. Patients may not respond to one and respond to the other, and patients may get uh, more side effects on one than they would a different one. So it would be worth, in some cases, moving within the class of NSAIDs to treat patients if you, you know, you're, have a patient and one's not working as well as you want it to. We talked about this last fall in a little bit of detail, but just to review, uh, the mechanism is based around the arachidonic acid pathway. So you have arachidonic acid, which is an icosanoid precursor, and icosanoids are basically inflammatory and immune messengers. So if you have something like some kind of a tissue injury, uh, arachidonic acid is going to be released, and it's a precursor to these icosanoids, which will end up um, promoting an inflammatory and immune system related response. So arachidonic acid is converted by cyclooxygenase into the following things, prostaglandins, cyclins, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes, which we've talked about in varying degrees in this course. And basically, if you shut down this pathway, you are going to prevent these inflammatory mediators from being able to be produced. So just as a more visual way, you've got tissue injury, so your arachidonic acid gets released which upregulates cyclooxygenase, which starts production of the following things. So what NSAIDs do is they block specific cyclooxygenase enzymes. There's two that we talk about when it comes to pain management and NSAID pharmacology, and they're COX-1 and COX-2, so cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2. COX-1 is the constantly active cyclooxygenase. It's responsible for generating housekeeping prostaglandins and is relatively helpful in the body. So it does things like protect the gastric epithelial cells from stomach acid damage. COX-2 is the one that's inducible. It's usually upregulated depending on different types of stimuli and there it's the major source of inflammatory and um, cancer related prostaglandins. So from a drug targeting perspective, you need a drug that can block COX-2 to be an effective NSAID. If it doesn't, if you just had, for example, a COX-1 selective NSAID, it doesn't really make any sense pharmacologically because all you'd be doing is preventing um, the production of good housekeeping prostaglandins, and you'd ultimately be causing more side effects than you would any therapeutic benefit. So all NSAIDs target COX-2 to some degree, and then how much they target COX-1 makes them more or less selective. So what I mean by that is you'll hear people talk about COX selectivity with NSAIDs. Now, this is not doesn't have to be complicated. This chart maybe makes it a little more complicated than it has to, but I just wanted to point out something. Celecoxib is really the only pure COX-2 selective NSAID on the market. This type gives you um, meloxicam and etotalac as well, which are somewhat heavily COX-2 selective, but they still have some COX-1 activity. And then... You have uh, NSAIDs like ibuprofen and naproxen, which are probably the two most commonly taken NSAIDs, which are basically have an equal propensity to block COX-1 or COX-2. So it's, again, <laughs> I say this every year. I should make my own chart because this one I, I took from the internet a long time ago, and I always have to clarify it. <laughs> but, I mean, it's, it's correct. But the point is, is <clears throat> instead of saying non-COX-2 selective, if you want to think about that, is just non-selective. So it has affinity for COX-1 and COX-2. This one means that it has um, maybe slightly more COX-2 activity, and then this one would have heavily or in celecoxib case, all COX-2. Now, there's been a bunch of other celecoxib-like drugs that have come to market in various parts of the world and in the U.S. that are no longer on the market because they've had some side effect issues, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but first, let's talk about general NSAID safety. So NSAIDs are all renally toxic, and we've talked about that when it came to acute kidney injury last semester, so that should be hopefully fresh. Um, and there's also pregnancy concerns related to um, early and late pregnancy. Sometimes you might see people be recommended like ibuprofen during pregnancy, but it's usually pretty rare. And certainly if you can avoid it, you're going to want to avoid it in the first trimester and um, during uh, the later stages of pregnancy when delivery could be imminent because there are bleeding risks associated with taking NSAIDs. Um, GI bleeding is probably the 
biggest side effect that we're worried about with NSAIDs. And these charts show you which ones have more propensity to cause GI bleeding. Funny enough, um, you know, we just talked about ibuprofen being a non-selective NSAID. Well, it actually has one of the lowest GI bleeding risks out of all NSAIDs on the market. Um, other ones that are pretty well tolerated are, here, here again we have ibuprofen, uh, naproxen also being fairly low. Um, Ketorolax not on this one, but it's over here. Ketorolax notoriously kind of the highest GI bleed risk one. We actually restrict how long people can take that medication. And then on this slide you have celecoxib, which is our COX-2 selective NSAID. You can see how low of an incidence that has almost no incidence whatsoever and that's because it doesn't affect cox1 and so you don't restrict those housekeeping prostaglandins therefore you don't risk epithelial epithelial damage so that's the the whole mechanism here you're talking about NSAIDs that are non-selective that target both cox1 and cox2 can reduce that protective layer in the gi tract putting your epithelial tissue at risk for uh, acid erosion, and ultimately that can cause ulceration and bleeding. And here's just kind of a diagram with some nice thunderbolts and stuff showing that. <laughs> All right. Um, so GI bleed risk, again, being probably the biggest concern we have. Um, some general risk factors for NSAID use in GI bleed. Uh, if you're over age 65, if your creatinine clearance is less than 40. So if you're renally impaired and you aren't clearing the NSAID as much, you're more risk at, or at higher risk for accumulation and toxicity. If you've had a prior ulcer or GI bleeding history, obviously that would put you at higher risk. Um, other things to think about, just um, general anticoagulant use. So if somebody's on warfarin or a, or a DOAC or they're on um, aspirin or Plavix or something like that or clopidogrel, then that would give them uh, higher risk. Other drugs like glucocorticoids, um, SSRIs are antidepressants that are really commonly used. Those are less likely to cause issues, but still something we, we consider as possible increased risk. And then the more things you're on, the more additive the toxicity becomes. So if you're on an anticoagulant and an antiplatelet and you take an SSRI for your depression, yeah, then you have a much higher risk. Maybe avoiding NSAIDs and altogether would be a good idea. Uh, I get the question all the time, though. Well, I don't get the question, I should say. <laughs> it comes up quite a bit, though, where you run into patients who are on long-term anticoagulation and they have an osteoarthritis component. So like, what is the risk to treat them, is it okay to give somebody uh, an NSAID as needed in those situations? That's going to be a risk-benefit scenario. I think some patients, you know, if they if they have pain and it's preventing them from having a good quality of life, and NSAIDs seem to work well for them, it might be worth the risk of the bleed to do it. But again, that's a little bit of a controversial statement. So it really depends on the patient and how comfortable you are with that. And then chronic versus PRN usage. If you have some patient who, again, like let's take an example of somebody on warfarin, they take ibuprofen twice a month for a headache, probably no big deal there. If they're taking it three times a day for osteoarthritis, much higher risk of GI bleed. And then the other thing we can do is, besides limiting use, if somebody is on one regularly, if we want to protect them, um, so maybe looking at switching to a COX-2 selective NSAID, so using celecoxib or a proton pump inhibitor um, in conjunction with the NSAID therapy to prevent uh, stomach acid secretion. So that'll make the general pH of the GI tract a little bit more neutral, closer to neutral anyway, and ultimately that helps with uh, the bleeding risk and decreases bleeding risk substantially. So if you do have somebody on chronic NSAID therapy and they are at one of these higher bleeding risks, then a proton pump inhibitor is highly recommended. Other drug interactions, lithium we haven't talked about yet, it's for bipolar disease, but it can, um, NSAIDs can actually interfere with how lithium is cleared renally and that can cause toxicity and lithium is a very narrow spectrum drug. So if you work in psych, um, that's something to remember. If not, probably not a useful thing. <laughs> Excuse me. We'll talk about that again during mental health a little bit. Antihypertensives, um, NSAIDs, because they decrease your um, 
prostaglandin, prostacyclin production, some of those things are natural vasodilators and they can work against that. So if you do have somebody with chronic hypertension, having NSAIDs on board regularly can work counter to your goals of bringing down their blood pressure. Um, doubling up on NSAIDs. So generally not recommended to usually double up on any class of drug. Uh, so the preferred would be to maximize your dose and then to switch within the class if you need to. Uh, but it's really common to find these medications over the counter in different products and you might not necessarily know that it actually has an NSAID in it. So for example, naproxen and ibuprofen are both over the counter. Uh, and again, there's lots of combination products that might use those and it'd be relatively easy for a patient to combine them without really knowing what they're doing. So if somebody is on an NSAID, one of your patients is, it's always a good recommendation just to talk to them about NSAID therapy and making sure that they understand that they shouldn't be taking more than one NSAID and to look at labels of medications and things of that nature, because that's where you do get higher risk of GI bleed and possible kidney toxicity as well. Okay, so this gets a little bit controversial. You might, if you Google NSAIDs and cardiovascular risk, you might see all kinds of opinions and articles that may or may not be highly scientific. Uh, but um, I think this came across my desk a while ago when my dad was taking an NSAID and you know he was Googling about this. And so I, I was reading into this and there's a lot of interesting debates in the medical community about NSAIDs and cardiovascular risk. But um, this is kind of the general breakdown of what is thought to be the controversy. So uh, basically, they think that NSAIDs, by blocking COX-2, you end up with an increased risk of thromboembolic complications. The reason is, is you get decreased prostacyclin production, so you can predispose you to vascular endothelial injury. And it may also have an effect on endothelial cells and nitric oxide production. So some roundabout mechanisms in there. Um, Vioxx was a drug called Rofacoxib that was out on the market in the U.S. Um, around the same time Celebrex or Celecoxib first came out, and it was associated with a twofold increased risk of cardiovascular events compared to placebo, and they ended up removing it from the market because of that. Celecoxib wasn't shown to increase the risk significantly at standard dosing, but at the higher dosing that they studied it in or that they initially approved it in, it was seen to do that. So Celebrex was able to stay on the market, but they just dose restricted it a little bit um, so that people weren't taking those higher doses. Um, if, you do, if you do have a patient with high cardiovascular risks, so if they're post-MI or high risk for an MI or um, any type of acute coronary syndrome or heart failure patient or anything like that, you certainly wouldn't want to use any NSAID of any kind in those patients. It's just not worth the possible risk. Um, and then there's also the hemodynamic issues with blood pressure and things like that as well. So um, highly COX-2 selective NSAIDs tend to carry the highest risk for CV. However, remember what I said that all NSAIDs inhibit some COX-2. So therefore, they all have some cardiovascular risk. So if you did have somebody and you were a little bit worried about this risk, maybe they weren't overtly, you know, post-ACS or something like that, but maybe they had a family history of early cardiac death or something, something of that nature where you may be a little bit concerned um, and they wanted to take something. Naproxen is probably the one with the lowest risks, um, and naproxen is actually thought to have maybe a more sustained antiplatelet effect at higher doses, which might be a little bit cardioprotective for acute coronary syndrome. So there's some mechanism there that they think happens. And remember, NSAIDs work in that. Let me just skip back quickly to this pathway here. Remember that uh, cyclooxygenase is responsible for thromboxanes. And remember, aspirin blocks arachidonic acid, so it works upstream in the pathway. And that's how it affects platelet inhibition. So NSAIDs uh, are going to interfere with your body's ability to clot um, via platelets as well. It, the mechanism doesn't necessarily affect thrombo. Like if you take ibuprofen regularly, you aren't at super high risk of bleeding um, compared to aspirin, which is interesting. I'm not entirely sure how that works, just maybe the, the way the enzymes are manipulated and what they affect more heavily than others potentially. Uh, but uh, if you ever have somebody going into surgery, you're always going to have them hold off on taking any type of NSAID you know, for the next uh, seven days or so leading up until surgery just to make sure that they don't have any platelet risk there. 
Okay. Um, so what is the ultimate risk here? Um, there's an increased chance of myocardial infarction, stroke, heart failure, AFib, and cardiovascular death. <laughs> so quite a variety of different CV complications, although the risk was pretty small. So there's uh, studies showed a one to two uh, per a thousand person years. And basically, if somebody had no CV risk, it was um, extremely, extremely low. And then if people were using short-term therapy or as needed therapy, it was basically non-existent. So what I tell people is that avoid heart failure. Um, you could probably say, although this is really obvious, but I should probably put this in here, acute coronary syndrome, um, and then maybe caution and hypertension. But other than that, uh, it's going to be a case-by-case -case type scenario. All right, now let's talk about NSAIDs and aspirin. So I just mentioned this type of mechanism. Now, what about people who are on aspirin already, and what is the recommendation for NSAIDs? So NSAIDs interfere with antiplatelet activity. Um, interestingly enough, they kind of compete with aspirin for the binding site on COX-1, and then they prevent irreversible reaction that inhibits COX-1 for the remaining life of the platelets. So while aspirin tends to have a much more effective pathway to platelet inhibition, um, NSAIDs in general uh, don't do that as effectively as aspirin, so they can actually interfere and compete with aspirin. Um, certain uh, drugs don't seem to cause this, so celecoxib and diclofenac don't seem to interfere with aspirin. But most patients, if they're on a daily aspirin, probably have some history of cardiac disease, so should they be on an NSAID at all anyway is really the question I would ask. But if you were to put somebody on an NSAID and aspirin, maybe celecoxib would be a better option although that one has more CV-related risk potentially. So <laughs> you can see how this gets complicated. Um, that's why a lot of patients who have CV risk, they, they'll just sort of have a blanket statement like no no NSAIDs whatsoever because this is gets complicated from a, a interference and a pharmacologic interactions uh, point of view. So the most risky uh, and with non-selective NSAIDs, ibuprofen and naproxen are shown to interfere with aspirin more so than other ones. Uh, what you can do is if you have somebody on the two, or if you have somebody who is on aspirin who takes ibuprofen as needed for a headache, just make sure that they space it apart. So take the drug about two hours around aspirin. Um, the reason why is because once that drug's absorbed, gets into the bloodstream, it's already had its effects on platelets, and therefore your NSAID shouldn't really be able to compete with it directly. But if you take them at the same time, that's more the risk. Or if somebody is taking naproxen, which is a 12-hour half-life or so, kind of a long-acting NSAID, if they take that twice a day every day, um, that could interfere with their aspirin. So it depends on how they're taking the NSAID. Um, and then just, for example, NSAIDs of all kinds contraindicated for perioperative pain for cabbage surgery. So bypass surgery, I uh, certainly want to avoid that specifically because it interferes with aspirin and we need uh, platelets not to stick together in those newly um, transplanted bypass, bypass grafts. Okay. Uh, some other interesting things about NSAIDs, this is the ceiling effect theory that basically says you can only get so much analgesia out of an NSAID, and pushing the dose higher will re result in more side effects. So two theoretical ceilings with NSAIDs. The first is there's an analgesic ceiling, which might be different for acute pain versus chronic. Chronic might be a higher dose ceiling than acute pain. Then there's the anti-inflammatory ceiling, which is thought to be significantly higher. So for example, ibuprofen, um, it's thought that it's about 400 milligrams for pain, and for inflammation, it's 800 milligrams. Now, the question I always ask myself is, well, how do you know if it's inflammation or pain? Is inflammation causing the pain? Isn't the whole idea of I NSAIDs being effective because they reduce inflammation, so therefore wouldn't the higher dose always be more effective? And th that's kind of where I struggle with this a little bit. Um, but there are really interesting studies out there. A lot of them are smaller, but looking at comparing um, different dosing strategies with NSAIDs. So for example, giving 400 milligrams versus 800 and not really seeing any difference and the reason this is important is because if you can get by with a lower dose for pain management, you can reduce your overall risk of side effects more so. Uh, you have lower risk of GI bleed, uh, less heart on the kidneys, etc. So how important is this really? Um, you know, people are going to take what's based on um, our recommendations as healthcare providers. So I think it does become pretty important. And I think I would say... 
um, to have your patients always start with a, a lower dose if they can. Try 400 milligrams for, for your headache for ibuprofen. If that doesn't work, you know, bump it up to 600. If that doesn't work, you can try 800 on occasion. But um, make sure people, if they are taking those higher doses, understand that that's not something they should be doing on a regular basis. And if they're taking it multiple times a day, that's where people get at high risk for GI bleeds. And also, um, with GI bleeds, it comes with instructions on taking the NSAIDs with food, taking it with a lot of water, not laying down um, afterwards so the, the NSAID can move through the GI tract with gravity a little bit better. So there's lots of recommendations to help that, but the point is is that um, don't tell somebody generally to just go straight for the big dose if they can try the lower dose and work that way. Now if you have somebody who's like in some sort of post-op pain and you don't want to use opioids and you want to, your, your pure goal is to reduce inflammation, so maybe like, you know, post-dental surgery or something like that, giving somebody 800 milligrams of ibuprofen to take um, as needed or around the clock for a few days might not be a bad idea, but just different strategies for different types of um, situations. Uh, so let's talk about salicylates quickly uh, and get into, as we get into the actual drugs here. So salicylates are kind of NSAIDs, so aspirin's kind of an NSAID. It's mostly used for antiplatelet effects. It doesn't really have a lot of analgesic use, but you can use it for anti-inflammatory and, and analgesic use. However, the problem is, is that with aspirin, you get poor GI tolerability with your higher doses. So if you try to push that dose for uh, pain response, you're, you're generally not going to have the patient tolerate it all that well. Uh, salicylate is something they brought up in when I was in pharmacy school a lot, and I feel like I've never actually seen anyone take it, but I feel obligated to mention it because it's sort of like a middle-of-the-road product that's not quite a full NSAID, not quite aspirin either, somewhere, again, that lives in the middle there, and it's thought to be not quite as risky as an NSAID from a GI bleed perspective, but also maybe not as effective as an NSAID. So it's something that could be considered as maybe an option for somebody who is struggling with NSAID use or needs something beyond just acetaminophen. Um, but again, I don't really see this used all that often. It's very rare. I don't even know if it's really still available. I think it is, but it's not a really commonly thing used item. Okay, so acetaminophen or Tylenol, it, Tylenol isn't actually an NSAID technically, but we don't really have another category for Tylenol, so we're going to put it here. And I mean, it technically might reduce inflammation, and it's non-steroidal, so I guess you could make the argument it kind of qualifies as an NSAID, but technically not an NSAID uh, by by um, our standard definitions. So um, some people call Tylenol or acetaminophen paracetamol, which is the European or British name for it. It's also abbreviated APAP. Um, which is the chemical name of it. So I can't remember. Acetophenyl paracetamol, something like that. <laughs> uh, you can look it up if you really care. But you'll see like combination products on prescription labels will say like something plus APAP, and that's acetaminophen. Although I think people have been trying to get away from that abbreviation because most people in the public don't see APAP and understand what that means. So if you're taking a medication on a prescription bottle that is a combo drug that has acetaminophen in it and it's abbreviated APAP, then how would you know not to take, you know, your Tylenol you have at home in your medicine cabinet? You wouldn't. So that's become a little bit out of favor. So we're trying to use better abbreviations, but again, you might see it abbreviated that way from time to time. General dosing for acetaminophen is going to be anywhere from 325 up to 1,000 milligrams per dose, and it's usually every four to six hours as needed. Uh, it's weight-based in kids, and I just put that on there because we'll talk about that again during pediatrics, but uh, Tylenol is probably the most common antipyretic option you're going to try in a kid or um, if somebody has, if a kid has pain as well, but it's uh, super common. So it's just a good dose to know um, if you have family members or if you have kids of your own. Uh, who have illnesses, it's a nice thing to be able to remember quickly what to do. Tylenol comes orally and rectally and also in an IV formulation. And uh, what, however you use it, most I mean most commonly it's going to be given orally. Um, this IV formulation of Tylenol is sort of interesting because um, it, it was studied in a lot of post-op settings and in obstetrics and things like that. And they sh were able to show that by giving IV Tylenol, they were able to reduce overall opioid use. However, 
they didn't actually compare it to people getting oral Tylenol. They compared it to people getting just like what they called standard of care, which is basically like post-op opioid pain management versus people getting post-op opioid pain management plus IV Tylenol. It's like, well, why didn't they compare it to oral Tylenol? Well, because oral Tylenol costs basically nothing. It's essentially free when we look at the grand scheme of healthcare. You know, you're talking about pennies per tablet or less than pennies per tablet even. And, you know, that's a bottle of IV Tylenol is like a hundred bucks a shot. So there's a, obviously a, a big financial incentive for this company to show that they are um, superior or are offering some kind of a benefit anyway. But unfortunately, I don't think the evidence is there. However, there are a lot of providers out there that seem to really push this for some reason. They, they just I think it's their personal experience with it. They really like it. Uh, but that doesn't really matter when it comes to um, hospital formularies and things like that. Unfortunately, provide well. Fortunately, I should say, um, even if you really think that this is a good product, uh, the hospital has the ability to override it and say, "Yeah, well, that's great, but uh, the studies say otherwise, so you need to use what our standard is and save money." So it's all about being a good steward of your um, financial resources and pharmaceutical resources. And just because something's available doesn't mean you you have the ultimate right to use it. I'm not trying to talk down to anyone, but I think we just get in this conversation with providers a lot who want to use something and they don't really want to try the alternative, even if it's much, much less expensive. So just to keep that in mind, this is a product um, that is, the, the IV product is actually useful if you have somebody who can't take things orally. Um, for whatever reason. So there is some some utility there, but at the end of the day, it's way more expensive than the alternative oral dose. So um, just be careful using it and you might get flagged if you try to use it too much by um, an internal metric or something like that. Uh, so just a little warning there. Um, Tylenol, from a study perspective, is considered, you know, you can look at a lot of different studies about Tylenol or acetaminophen and it's um, basically a semi-effective pain reliever, right? It, it doesn't really, it seems to be better than placebo, but that's about it. It doesn't really fit into, uh, it doesn't really, it hasn't really been proven to be better than anything else. So pretty much every study I've ever read that compares acetaminophen to any actual non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug uh, shows that the NSAID is superior. Um, that doesn't mean Tylenol or acetaminophen isn't worth trying, but uh, it does mean that you, you don't necessarily know if you're going to get a benefit from it. Um, it is a pretty decent antipyretic, so for reducing fever, it's fairly effective for that. And the other nice thing about it is it's sort of in its own category, which I'll talk about here in a second, but you can put it uh, in combination with any other pain medication, and that includes NSAIDs. So you could combine this with ibuprofen if you want to. A lot of people don't think you can take them together or at the same time, and you, you absolutely can. Um, and it's also thought to be very safe in pregnancy. It's sort of the go-to for pregnancy. Um, let's continue here. Is there anything else I want to say? I just want to make sure I'm covering my the points that are in my head quick. The other thing I'll mention on this slide quickly is that um, acetaminophen isn't renally cleared. It doesn't have any renal restrictions either. So for people with kidney issues, cardiovascular issues, pregnant patients, acetaminophen is very safe for all those different types of conditions. So that's the nice thing about acetaminophen. It's just a shame that it's not as effective, but that's, that's sort of what comes with the territory. When you have drugs that aren't as effective, they're going to be generally safer overall because they don't really do a whole lot. <laughs> so if you think about it that way, like what are they doing once they get into the body? Well, we don't really know. Um, with Tylenol, actually, it's it's a real mechanism. That's kind of the funny. Another funny part about acetaminophen is that um, the actual mechanism of it is unknown. So it's one of the most commonly taken medications in the world. I don't really know how it works. Um, it's thought that there might be some some other types of cyclooxygenase enzymes, like a COX three or something like that, that it inhibits. But no one really knows how Tylenol works, which is really funny, I think, because why would you have this? Why would you, why would you recommend a drug if you don't know how it works? But it's just one of those things we've grandfathered in over time that we sort of accept that it works, but we don't really know how. And um, no one really wants to bother probably studying it because it's like you wouldn't really get any money back for that. And there's no money in studying Tylenol. So there you go. Uh, acetaminophen also comes as a 
combination product for a lot of things. Basically, anything that is over-the-counter cough and cold combo probably has acetaminophen in it. Um, there's a lot of opioid painkillers that are comboed with acetaminophen, so brand names like Norco and Percocet are drugs that have oxycodone plus acetaminophen. It doesn't really have any drug interactions except when you take a lot of it. And uh, that's the only real risk with Tylenol is taking it too much of it, and it can be hepatotoxic in high doses. We'll talk about that during toxicology a little bit more. But basically, when you take too much acetaminophen, your body gets to a point where it can't process it correctly anymore in the liver. And so it shunts it down a different pathway, which creates a hepatotoxic intermediary. This usually isn't a big deal for most people, but if you take like a huge overdose of Tylenol, it can be hepatotoxic, and in, in rare cases, it can cause um, liver failure and death. Um, all right, moving on to ibuprofen, um, probably the second most commonly taken pain medication next to Tylenol. Brand names are Advil or Motrin. This is by far the most commonly used NSAID out there. And um, similar to, to acetaminophen, what we just talked about as far as OTC use, you're going to see this in a lot of combination products and highly prevalent in cough and cold medications as well. So just to be careful when you um, have a patient who's taking maybe just plain ibuprofen, they might also be taking um, a cough and cold medication that has the same thing in it. Uh, dosing is 200 to 800 milligrams every six hours. Max is 3.2 grams a day, which is pretty high. A lot of people don't think you can take that much, but you can. Usually you don't take that type of a dose unless you're treating like um, rheumatoid arthritis or something like that with NSAID therapy, um, but you can technically take that much. Most people are going to stick to like 600 milligrams three times a day. It's a little more common. <clears throat> The over-the-counter tablets come in 200 milligram doses, and the prescription tablets are 400, 600, or 800. So, of course, you could just tell somebody to take their OTC product and take, you know, however many multiples they need to get to the dose you want. Or, you know, you can prescribe them the the over the, the prescription product. But just so you know, an 800 milligram ibuprofen tablet is quite large. So, if patients are comfortable swallowing that or not is another story. Uh, ibuprofen is thought to have the lowest GI bleeding risk. We talked about that a little bit earlier. And minimal other side effects are really drug interaction issues. Um, studies pretty consistently show that better pain control is achieved with ibuprofen than acetaminophen. It also has just as good, if not better, antipyretic effects. So if you're, uh, if you can tolerate it, it's probably the better alternative. But then again, there's, we talked about all the risks with NSAIDs and issues with NSAIDs. So there's certainly some restrictions that might come up here and there. Naproxen. So naproxen is sort of like the long-acting, easy-to-obtain NSAID. Dose ranges from 200 to 1,000 milligrams per dose. 1,000 would be really rare with, N with naproxen. Most people take um, the, the over-the-counter one comes as a 220 milligram tablet. People usually take one or two of those, I would say. Very similar to ibuprofen. Um, you have uh, higher strength prescription products available, and you have different salt formulations. You have a base and a sodium. It doesn't really matter. I'm not going to get into that or care that you know that. But if you order it on like a, uh, an electronic medical record, you might see those two things pop up. Um, it doesn't, again, doesn't really matter. But the one that is over the counter, like the Aleve branded one, is the, uh, I think it's the sodium salt. It's the one that's 220 milligrams. So if you want somebody taking OTC, naproxen, that's the one you want. If you're prescribing it, you might pick like the 250 or the 500 milligram dose. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. It's all the same thing. It's just a different salt and the dosing is very similar regardless. So don't want to confuse you too much, but just in case you see that come up, just know that there are two different formulations of naproxen. Okay, ketorolac is probably the next most common NSAID that I see pretty regularly. It's considered to be the higher potency NSAID out of all of them, although there is a lot of controversy around whether ketorolac is really that much better than like ibuprofen. Um, and literature, I guess, generally doesn't support it really being any more effective. Uh, there's actually, there's some interesting studies out there about ketorolac. There's one, and I, I should have put the reference in here, I forgot. You can probably Google or PubMed it if you want. Um, but there's um, a study looking at people who were in the emergency department, and they either offered them 
Ketorolac IM. So that's one of the nice things about Ketorolac. It's one of the only NSAIDs that you can give in a non-PO delivery form. Um, so what they would do is they would give people either a saline shot or a shot of Ketorolac and they'd randomize them to either get oral NSAID or a placebo oral. And uh, they showed that the, the oral group responded just as well to pain as the IM group. So the question was, is it, you know, were they getting a, a placebo effect from that perceived IM injection? Or are the medications really just basically the same thing regardless of how you administer them? So when I first started practicing in emergency medicine, Ketorolac was used a ton at relatively high doses. So like IV and IM, it comes in, you can give it in either one of those formulations. Now, if you have somebody NPO, it makes a lot of sense to give Ketorolac. Again, it's got a good value in that particular patient category. Otherwise, um, if you're going to give Ketorolac IM to somebody, uh, stick to a low dose. So the high, highest dose you can give, um, for IM is 60 milligrams. We actually only give like 15 now, and for IV, we don't go higher than 15 either. Again, there's other studies out there that I didn't mention here, but there are studies that show that uh, there's no difference between those two doses really when you give them, ex with the exception of maybe in certain subset populations like rheumatoid arthritis or certain post-op patients um, where you're really targeting heavy anti-inflammatory effects. But for analgesic relief, acute analgesic effects, um, the low dose seems to work just as fine as the other dose. And you um, reduce the side effects of the most notorious NSAID out there. So Ketorolac has the highest GI bleeding risk out of any NSAID. So if you can, one, reduce your dose, and two, reduce the duration and use, that's going to be big. But generally, with Ketorolac, we don't ever use it for more than five days due to that GI bleeding risk. So you will see those restrictions if you try to order the product. In most cases, most electronic ordering systems, whether you're ordering it for outpatient use orally or inpatient use IM or IV, you're going to see like no more than five days recommended. Or the, the electronic medical record might actually just cut you off and say, sorry, you can't do this anymore. Um, Diclofenac is another one that's uh, an interesting NSAID that I thought I'd bring up specifically um, versus just throwing it onto a slide with a bunch of random stuff. The reason is, is the only topical NSAID option, and it does come orally, so you can take it as a tablet, but um, where Diclofenac's gotten more popular as as a gel, which is this Voltaren gel. Voltaren was the brand name. It's now generic, so it's a lot less expensive, which is nice. It also comes as a patch, which was the brand name Flector, but they're both Diclofenac. They both deliver transdermal absorption and um, to the site of action. So like people who have maybe just some osteoarthritis on one knee or something like that, they can get a lot of benefit out of this because they can put the drug basically directly onto the site of action. It absorbs, it causes local anti-inflammatory effects, and it causes analgesic relief in that specific area. So um, this just shows you, this was looking at um, Voltaren gel when it came on the market. So again, topical diclofenac and the absorption systemically. So you do get some systemic absorption, but compared to oral, it's quite a bit less. Even with higher doses, you're still looking at about a one-fifth the absorption. So for patients with GI bleeding issues or kidney issues, these can be really nice options to still provide somebody with an NSAID for analgesic purposes without putting them at high risk for systemic side effects. So um, I, I want I think this is a good one for people to remember. Uh, it's it's really popular, so maybe it's not that big of a, a thing to remember anymore because I think it seems to be on people's mind a lot now. As at least I see it prescribed quite often now. But it's something to think about when you're when your back's against a wall when it comes to pain management. You're trying to think of all creative alternatives for people who aren't NSAID tolerant. Um, this is a really nice option that pretty much anyone could take. You, you know, if somebody had really severe cardiovascular disease or um, kidney disease, you might not want to use it. But even in those patients, and I'm not necessarily recommending this, but it could be one of those benefits outweighs risk scenarios. Like, you know, if we use a small amount of Voltaren gel daily uh, and we're getting like a little bit of absorption, is that really enough risk for us to care that this person's, you know, getting out of or relieving their pain? Um, it could be worth that, you know, very slight risk that you're getting versus giving them an oral NSAID. So just something to think about. It's a nice option. And, you know, any other option when it comes to pain management that's not an opioid, I'm always a fan of. So certainly um, keep that one in the back of your mind when it comes to um, treating patients for um, 
mostly like localized type pain, like osteoarthritis type pain, joint pain. Um, other non-selective options out there. So there's a bunch of other NSAIDs that are used occasionally. Um, I don't really care you know these really well other than to know that they are NSAIDs, but um, just some little pearls about them, I guess. Uh, E-total, I don't really have anything to say. Indomethacin uh, is a really common one used in obstetrics to stop preterm labor. We'll talk about that mechanism specifically during OB this summer. Um, the other in place indomethacin uh, was originally studied was for gout. Uh, now, you can use other NSAIDs for gout, too. Ibuprofen and naproxen work for gout as well, but you'll see endomethacin sometimes recommended specifically for gout because it was studied for gout flares. We'll talk about that during the RA lecture in the next set of slides. Um, Solendec, don't have anything to say about that. Meloxicam is a, a really nice option because it's once daily, and I think it's the, it's the longest acting NSAID out there. It's also very heavily COX-2 selective. So for patients who are struggling with taking multiple tablets a day, or um, they're maybe taking NSAIDs for osteoarthritis and they want something they can just take once a day in the morning, Meloxicam is actually a pretty good choice and it's a popular option for that reason. It also has, <coughs> excuse me, relatively lower GI bleeding risk because it's heavily COX-2 selective. Um, Paroxicam, don't really have anything to say about that one, not a really commonly used NSAID. And Nebumatone is, um, again, I don't really, I'm just going to stop talking at this point. You can know that these are NSAIDs. You'll see all of these used to some degree, but you get kind of into the weeds with some of this, and these get quite rare. You don't really see them all that much, but occasionally you see people on them. Why people get to those, I, I don't know. I suppose they try other ones, and they don't work, and they give this one a shot, and it ends up working better for them than, than other options. So kudos to them for finding that drug that works, but you don't see it all that often. And then let's talk about celecoxib specifically, or brand name Celebrex. So again, this is our only pure COX-2 on the U.S. market right now. It doesn't have a lot of GI risk whatsoever. However, for people who are taking this, they're usually going to be taking it with a proton pump inhibitor. The one big difference about celecoxib and how we give it to patients versus other NSAIDs is this one's usually not given PRN. So this is almost always scheduled dosing. So people are taking their Celebrex every day, twice a day. And then you have um, other NSAIDs like ibuprofen and naproxen are much more commonly used on a PRN scheduled, uh, a PRN type basis where they just take, people take them when they need them. People would rarely do this with celecoxib. It doesn't really have any effect on platelet function. There's, um, some risk with doses above 200 milligrams a day. So usually if people are taking it, we keep it under that. And if somebody does have that history for um, severe cardiovascular complications, we want to avoid this medication altogether with them. All right, so that covers the NSAID drug category. Uh, kind of spent a long time on that, but it's a really important category because there's it's such a popular uh, option for patients across the board for pain management. Uh, muscle relaxants is the next category I have. Muscle relaxants are really a strange group of drugs. They have mixed mechanisms, but they all kind of do sep um, the same thing. They have some sort of re relaxation of muscle spasms, uh, and you know how they get there is is debatable as far as mechanism, but we'll talk about some of the options you have. These are mostly used for a short term or acute relief. However, there are a couple drugs that are more chronically uh, relevant for people who have long term spasticity issues. So people who have spinal cord injuries or are post stroke, that's more common. And uh, they are often used in addition to NSAIDs and opioids, or to spare opioid use. So if somebody is on an opioid regimen and um, you don't want them to be using as much drug as they have been or you want them to avoid getting heavily dependent on it, allowing a muscle relaxant regimen to complement that can be helpful as well. These drugs are generally sedating and anticholinergic, so that's something to remember too, that people might not be able to uh, function very well on a day-to-day -day basis if they're taking muscle relaxants because of the sedative properties of them. So taking them at night or taking them if they you know, don't have to drive that day or something would be um, usually ideal for most patients. Um, cyclobenzaprine or flexoril is probably the most common muscle, acute use muscle relaxant. It doesn't really know what its mechanism is, it's thought to reduce somatic motor activity, having some effects on gamma 
and alpha motor neurons and also some central effects on norepinephrine, which again kind of means nothing to me. Uh, that could be any number of things, but basically it works in the central nervous system, causes some kind of a downstream effect, inhibitory pathways activated that prevent um, spasticity. So it's a commonly used generic medication. People don't usually take it for more than a couple weeks, and even that would be long. It's um, um, the urine drug screening thing. Don't worry about that too much. It is similar in structure and mechanism to a tricyclic antidepressant, which um, those the reason why this is important is tricyclic antidepressants are heavily or extremely deadly in overdose. So if you're drug screening somebody and you see this pop up, that could be a false flag there. Um, it is anticholinergic, so it will dry people out and cause sedation. And um, over time, it can cause, if people overdose on it, it can cause um, cardiovascular effects as well. I've worked with a number of physicians that basically don't believe that cyclobenzaprine does anything. It's kind of a um, a placebo effect type of a drug, but you know it's really commonly used and prescribed. So I imagine some people get relief out of it, but you know take that for what it's worth. I, I have I work with a lot of cynical physicians as well. <laughs> um, some other short-acting drugs that might work for acute uh, muscle relaxation: methylcarbamol, carisoprodol, metaxalone. Um, drugs that are benzodiazepines, which we haven't talked about yet, which we'll get to eventually here this this spring when we talk about psych and anxiety. Um, but there's a specific benzodiazepine called diazepam, or Valium is the brand name of that drug. And it's uh, commonly used in like post-op spine surgery as a muscle relaxant. And it's one of the more potent muscle relaxants out there. So a lot of times people will choose that um, as an adjunct uh, in patients who have muscle spasticity or, or are struggling in the post-op setting with spasticity and pain, um, especially for spinal uh, surgery. That seems to be a pretty common choice. As far as methylcarbamol and carisoprodol go, I don't really care. You know a ton about them other than they are muscle relaxants. They're anticholinergic. Carisoprodol is actually the only one that's a controlled substance. I think it's a C4 or a C5. Uh, so it's got a low control rating, but it is still controlled. And so that one actually has technically some potential for abuse. Otherwise, the other ones are not controlled substances, except for benzodiazepines are all controlled. So those are kind of our different category in and of themselves. OK, some other agents out there. These ones are um, unique and on a separate slide because they are mostly used for chronic spasticity. So tizanidine and baclofen. Um, are usually not taken as needed, and they usually aren't taken short term. They're usually around the clock dosing. And these are for your people who have um, chronic spasticity issues, again, mostly from spinal cord injury uh, or post stroke, is the two most common ones that I see. Um, I don't really have much to say. These are usually CNS depressants, and um, they can cause hypotension and sedation, are probably the two biggest side effects of both of them. They work differently, but I kind of put them in the same bucket in my mind as far as what they do and, and how they react or how people react to them. Baclofen can be given as an intrathecal pump. So you can actually put it in this sort of disc-like pump. This is obviously a child, so it's why it looks so big. Um, but that's sort of what it looks like. And then they can refill the pump and it administers drug intrathecally and can prevent spasticity. It's kind of a cool delivery mechanism. If you end up working in rehab, um, you'll probably see stuff like this. But if you don't, you'll never see it. So I don't want you to know this or think about this too much, but just uh, kind of a cool application of a medication. All right, so again, muscle relaxants are a very mixed bag. As far as where I'd use them, um, they're a nice in-between between an NSAID and a opioid, but they're more situational too. You actually have to have, you know, there's a lot of pain syndromes that it doesn't make any sense to prescribe a muscle relaxant to uh, or for. So you have to think about why you'd actually want to prescribe that medication. But for situations where there is um, spasticity, they do make sense um, to uh, use, especially from an opioid sparing perspective. Um, I'm sort of of the mindset that anything we can give that's not an opioid is better than going straight to opioids. So if we can try to, to synergize with some other medications, maybe you give NSAIDs plus you know, a muscle relaxant, you can do better than if you went straight to uh, an opioid analgesic. And with that being said, opioids, what everyone probably has been waiting for all year, because everyone likes talking about opioids, they're just interesting drugs, and they're always in the news about addiction and, uh, you know, the opioid crisis and all that stuff. So let's talk about opioid analgesics. 
So super common in modern medicine, um, and really they're our go-to drug of choice in the United States for acute pain. Um, we use them during procedures, post-procedures, um, and then uh, for a number of different other things as well. And patients all respond very differently to opioids. Some people don't really feel much. Some people just feel sleepy. Some people get really sick. Some people get itchy. And then some people feel very euphoric and, and want to continue to do that. And then they become you know, psychologically addicted to the medication. And there's a lot of difference. There's a, there's a huge spectrum of, of individuals within there. And hopefully there's a group of people that actually get pain response from them. So, uh, but don't be surprised if you give somebody a, an, an opioid. I've talked to so many patients where um, they come into the hospital, I'm just clarifying their medication list with them. And they've got, you know, an, a, a Percocet or something, an oxycodone from a previous surgery on there. And I asked them if they're still taking it. I was like, oh, I took one of those and it made me so sick. I'll never take that stuff again. Put that on my list. I never want anyone giving me that. The really strong response is like, I, again, I, if I had a dollar every time somebody told me that, I'd probably have like, you know, 20 bucks or something. So certainly you're going to see a lot of different people's um individual response to medicine come out when it comes to opioids and uh, there's no other real way to describe it um, unfortunately there there is that subset of people that rare subset of people you know three five percent of people who will take an opioid and will get that really euphoric response and will and will you know kind of develop that craving for it um, and that's something we really as healthcare providers need to be careful of and watch out for so just like when you give somebody an anticoagulant um, your risk of having a significant bleeding event is you know three five percent somewhere in there your risk of um, having somebody become addicted to an opioid is somewhere in that realm as well. So we have to be vigilant and watch out for these types of things. Um, with respect to the opioids themselves, there's a lot of different pharmacokinetics within the agents. They all kind of do the same thing. Um, lots of different dosage forms, oral, IV, transdermal, buccal, um, lots of different ways to give opioids. And the side effects um, and the safety profiles on them, they're all pretty standard, like an opioid related response is really, you know, uh, standardized as far as every drug basically does the same thing, just depends on how potent the medication is. Um, the other thing about opioids is they're relatively safe in pregnancy. They don't cause any teratogenic effects, so they can be used for pain syndromes in pregnancy. Of course, there are lots of reasons why we wouldn't want to give them because you don't want the fetus exposed to opioids and then possibly you know, have to be, in, be treated for withdrawal symptoms upon birth, which does happen, especially for patients who are pregnant and are abusing opioids during pregnancy. So that does happen to some people. So anyway... Um, what do I have that's fun on this picture? So this is a poppy plant, and um, the way they actually, well, this is more like making heroin, right? <laughs> so we're getting a little off topic, but um, opium was originally identified as part of these opium poppies, and so the way that they can extract that is before the flower blooms, apparently they can take like a razor blade. So a person does this, they take a razor blade and they make a little cut on the side, and then it leaks out this opium latex, these um, solution. And that's how they actually found opium originally. And I guess somebody decided they wanted to taste it or smoke it or something and got high. And, you know, and that's history at this point. Um, but that's actually how they still manufacture heroin on large scales is to get the, op the raw opium out of the um, poppy plant. And then they um, run it through some reactions and stuff to extract the heroin or to manipulate it into heroin. Okay, so let's talk about uh, some basic opioid stuff. Um, so anyway, analgesic effects, you get a minimum to significant pain relief. Again, this depends on the agent dose and also the person. Opioids have no ceiling dose. They, you'll see people for chronic pain on really, really high doses, and then you'll see some people just get really affected by tiny doses if they're opioid naive. So it all depends on how much you're used to having in your body. The effective pain release, uh, a pain relief, um, that opioids can provide is heavily limited by toxicity. If you give somebody too many opioids, they're going to um, either be overly sedated or they're going to stop breathing. Uh, so at a certain point, you're going to run into that ceiling effect, even though technically you could keep giving a dose to get pain relief, you wouldn't necessarily be able to um, keep going because of toxic effects. And then likewise, tolerance to the opioid also develops over time. So you'll have situations where people simply need more dose to get the same effects of the, of the uh, analgesic component. 
Um, sedation, if you give a light, a low dose of an opioid or a mild opioid, it's going to be quite minimal. However, it can be significant too. And in fact, there are some opioids we used um, directly for their sedative components in certain situations to induce comas or maintain comas in people. Uh, additionally, provide analgesic effects, but they also would work for that as well. Um, and then again, I've talked about the synergy uh, NSAIDs and benzodiazepines have synergistic effects with opioids. And usually you can get by by giving the two um, to get better pain control and overall use less of each individual agent. <clears throat> Opioids work by agonizing certain receptors. And the main one that they're going to work on are mu receptors. So that's what you're going to hear. Their mu agonist is essentially their mechanism of action. And um, you can see different mu receptors are receptors in the central nervous system that are responsible for things like analgesia, euphoria, confusion, dizziness, and also respiratory depression, um, GI effects such as nausea, constipation, uh, physical dependence. There's also kappa and delta receptors that are less well understood. Um, generally, you don't want anything uh, working on a kappa receptor because it causes people to feel dysphoric. Um, but it also has some analgesic components too. So the kappa receptor and also the delta receptors are probably ones that we might see more advanced versions of opioids target specifically, but I haven't really seen anything like that happen in my career yet, but who knows, we might see something different. But for the majority of them, mu1 and mu2 are gonna be targeted. And that's not because of choice, right? If you could just get by with targeting mu1 and causing um, just analgesia, you would, but you end up kind of with this whole bucket of side effects as well. And these receptors are ones that are in our body that naturally respond to um, things like endorphins that our body produces. So there are already systems built in that are part of our pleasurable reward system um, that the brain has uh, wired into it. And this type of drug just takes, uh, takes advantage of that particular system. So what it's doing ultimately is working in the central nervous system to alter the body's perception of pain. You aren't really getting any type of actual, well, you aren't getting any actual decreased inflammation or prevention of pain. You're just getting the way your brain is receiving the pain signals different. So it's kind of an interesting way to block the pain. Classic adverse effects. Again, hallmark effects that you're going to see basically with every opioid. Big ones are going to be sedate, sedation, altered consciousness, and decreased respiratory rates. Uh, those are the big ones to watch out for with patients, especially the respiratory rate. If you do overdose on an opioid, um, that's the biggest risk is that you stop breathing, and that's why people who overdose on heroin or other opioids die. Uh, it's because eventually they, they stop breathing if they take too much. Um, hemodynamic effects are usually not super important with opioids. You don't really see a lowering of blood pressure or heart rate. Maybe a slight drop, but not big. In fact, um, if we have patients struggling with uh, keeping their blood pressure up and we need to sedate them, we usually use fentanyl, which is a um, sedative opioid. Constipation is really common with opioids. So anyone who's on a regular opioid regimen needs to be on some kind of a bowel regimen too. We'll talk about that in the next module when we talk about GI but it's required. So make sure that if you're prescribing somebody opioids, you also talk to them about constipation, talk to them about using uh, like an over-the-counter stool softener or a stimulant laxative or something like that. Nausea and vomiting, um, common in some patients, not seen in others. Uh, difficult or urinating would be quite rare. And then um, the hallmark of being on opioids or having a uh, more heavily uh, I should say, if you're not necessarily an overdose, but if you've been taking opioids, um, your pinpoint pupils is something you'll see in patients as well. Um, the other thing that happens, especially a lot of times in post-op settings, is itching, and people get like a histamine release, which is sort of a, a weird side effect of taking opioids and just the way they're working in the body. And so a lot of times people will prescribe antihistamines, specifically hydroxyzine is a really common one that gets prescribed alongside of opioids because of the itching people will get with certain drugs. And then the physical dependence component too. Um, your body gets used to it, therefore you need more to sustain the same types of effects. <clears throat> 
Okay, so opium, I talked about this, uh, dried from opium poppy. 12% morphine is basically what is in opium that's giving the um, opioid-like effect. And we don't really use opium for direct analgesic purposes anymore, but there is this product called tincture of opium on the market, basically like a liquid opium that sometimes they use for severe chronic diarrhea that's not responding to other things. There's also... Um, a product called a belladonna and opium suppository. Belladonna is sort of like an atropine type drug, so it's uh, anticholinergic, and this can help prevent ure ureteral spasms. So sometimes post uh, for like urology urology procedures or surgeries, they might give this, um, or sometimes in emergency medicine they'll use it rarely, but not super common. But that's sort of the two weird uh, applications for opium. Otherwise, opium isn't really used anymore. From a medication perspective. Uh, to show you what opioids look like, I, I don't really show structures that much, but just looking at opioids, they all kind of look the same. So you've got morphine, codeine, hydrocodone, oxycodone, um, and then when you get into different ones, you get a little bit trickier um, as far as the structures go. So hydromorphone, you can see, has a much more sort of like what... So anyway, the, the top row, I should have finished my thought here, um, are all what's considered these aren't um, natural opioids, but they're more akin to the way morphine looks as far as the way they've been designed. And then um, hydromorphone is more of like a semi-synthetic opioid where they've altered the, the primary structure significantly with different side groups and stuff. And then fentanyl is a pure synthetic opioid where it doesn't even really look like this, but you do have some similar concepts as far as structure and enough so that it interacts with the same receptors. Uh, morphine is an old medication, but still pretty popular. The reason is it's cheap and it's effective. And interestingly enough, it's one of the earliest isolated plant alkaloids or plant-based uh, pharmaceutical products that um, we have documented evidence of using. It's available orally. So there's a re immediately released tablets and liquid, and um, there's extended release products as well that last longer. Um, it's available IV, although its onset's a little slower than some opioids, it's still quite effective. Morphine's probably biggest downside is it has a bunch of active metabolites that are renally eliminated. So if you have poor kidney function, you're not going to eliminate those um, metabolites as fast. So you can get accumulation and toxicity from morphine. Hydrocodone and oxycodone are two popular choices for oral uh, opioid use, and um, they're really similar products. I, oxycodone is slightly more potent. Originally, hydrocodone actually had a different control status than oxycodone. This is actually pretty recent. This changed a few years ago, but now they both have control two statuses. So that just meant that oxycodone was a lot, or hydrocodone, excuse me, was the C3, and oxycodone was always the C2, um, and that meant that hydrocodone was generally just easier to obtain. Um, there are less restrictions around prescribing it, and so now they've actually equalized the playing, leveled the playing field between those two, and so they're the same status now, which makes sense. They don't really have any reason for them to be different statuses. Um, hydrocodone is immediate release, uh, comes usually with acetaminophen. Uh, brand names that you've probably heard of is Vicodin. Vicodin actually isn't on the market anymore because it contained a 500 milligram dose of acetaminophen. So Usually what you see here are um, like 5, 500 uh, or 5, 325 is the new one. So Vicodin was the 5, 500, meaning it had contained 5 milligrams of hydrocodone plus 500 milligrams of acetaminophen. Uh, Norco was the brand name of the product that had 5 milligrams hydrocodone, 325 milligrams acetaminophen. And uh, the FDA made a ruling of uh, you know several years ago, I think while I was in still still in school, this went through that combination products with acetaminophen couldn't contain more than 500 milligrams, or uh, sorry, more than 325 milligrams. So that immediately invalidated Vicodin, and also there are some other drugs that were like I think there was one that was a 7.5 700 or something. I don't know. It was a really high dose, and that one's again off the market now too. So, so what you have now is really just one type of hydrocodone product, and that's going to contain 
um, some hydrocodone, and then 325 milligram of acetaminophen. Hydrocodone doesn't come by itself as an immediate release formulation. So you can't just get, at least in the U.S., you can't just get hydrocodone 5 milligrams. You have to have some sort of acetaminophen combo. The reason behind that is, well, you know, from a therapeutic perspective, they would tell you, well, it's going to give you that synergy with the acetaminophen. There's also some argument that it's supposed to prevent um, abuse as well because it's combined with something, which is kind of silly because if you take a whole bunch of that, not only are you going to get a lot of opioid effects, but you're possibly looking at acetaminophen toxicity as well. So the whole thing is just a weird reason why they're they're combined, but that's just the way it is. So that's what we work with. Um, there are different versions of this too, like there's a 10-325, and I think there's also a 7.5-325. I don't know, stick to five or ten, um, or just use two of the fives, and you're, you'll be just fine. There's no reason to really get fancy with these products. Um, there is a single hydrocodone product that's extended release called Hysingla. I've never seen it used. It's a once daily type thing. Um, these extended release products now, if the FDA wants, is going to approve them, they have to have something called like an abuse deterrent built into the tablet, which means that the tablet is really hard to crush, or if you try to mix it with water, it doesn't work very well. So the idea is you can't uh, inject the product very easily. Oh, where there's a will, there's a way. People will always figure out ways to get around these things. Uh, oxycodone actually does come as a single immediate release tablet. It comes as a five milligram tablet or Percocet, which is the most common one, probably one every single person's heard of, is five milligrams of oxycodone, 325 milligrams of acetaminophen. There's also different types of Percocets too. It's like a 10, you know, just like with Norco. So 10, 325, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, your combination is going to be a max of 325 acetaminophen and some amount of oxycodone, usually five milligrams. So whether you want to prescribe, um, you know, this always comes down to maybe your personal preference as a prescriber. If you're going to prescribe oxycodone, I think it's easier maybe to prescribe immediate release oxycodone plain with um, acetaminophen uh, as a, a second option for people to take alongside of it, um, or a separate option, I should say, versus giving them a Percocet tablet that has a combination product in it. That way you can control the dose of both, and that way you can easily give a higher dose of acetaminophen too. So acetaminophen, like, I mean, 325 milligrams of acetaminophen is the bare minimum you would give an adult patient for a single dose. And honestly, uh, it's funny, I work with a couple of pharmacists and they're all talking about Tylenol and how it's like, if you're going to take Tylenol, you might as well, you know, go big or go home. Like, it doesn't really have a lot of risks with it. It doesn't, unless you're, you know, taking too much of it. But let's just say you're taking, you know, below the four grams a day, you might as well take a full gram at one time. And in, in my opinion, with, with acetaminophen, just because it's not going to really affect the person adversely and you're you're giving the best op opportunity for acetaminophen to actually do anything if you're banking on that extra 325 milligram dose of doing anything uh, you're probably not going to see a whole lot of effect with it oxycodone extended release comes as the notorious oxycontin which i'm sure again everyone's heard of that uh, has been in the news a lot purdue pharmaceuticals made this product and has been under a lot of hot hot investigative uh, uh, well, bad press and whatever you want to say. They've been getting sued uh, with a variety of class action type things. Basically, for the crux of a lot of these cases revolves around them marketing their product as safe, uh, when in fact it wasn't. It was one of the most abused products that's ever probably hit the U.S. market as a legal pharmaceutical. Um, people were excited about this. Essentially, you have a drug that's as uh, potent as heroin, but was being made by a drug company. And because oxycodone extended release was designed to help people who were not opioid naive. So like, let's say you're a cancer patient and you have really bad cancer related pain. You've been on a number of different narcotics. Oxycodone is probably one of the things you've been taking. And so eventually you get to a point where you're taking a lot of oxycodone. And so an extended release every 12 hours product is really helpful for those patients. And I'm not denying the fact that there's a, there's a good use for, for these types of drugs. The problem is if you give somebody, you know, like a high dose of oxycontin, it could be like a 40 or an 80 milligrams in one tablet. And now all of a sudden, instead of, 
you know, having immediate release five milligram tablets available illicitly, like if there's some diversion from the pharmaceutical supply chain, if you divert a bottle of 80 milligram oxycodone ER, that's a lot more oxycodone in one dose. So people were able to get much higher amounts of this and people were abusing it and injecting it and whatever. And so oxycodone went off the market, then came back on the market and reformulated itself with an abuse deterrent. But I don't know, I think again, people are still finding uh, ways to abuse oxycodone. I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon, unfortunately. Uh, because these drugs are a little bit less um, directly derived from the original morphine product or the opioid products, they're a little bit more of a, like a semi-synthetic type drug. These products uh, don't cause quite as much itching, but they do. Um, and however, they're more potent than morphine uh, equivalent. <clears throat> so anyway, um, these are really relatively inexpensive, immediate release, like oxycodone or um, generic Norco or generic Percocet, you know, we combine it with the acetaminophen component, that's going to have uh, a pretty, or going to be quite inexpensive. Um, oxycodone, extended release, Oxycontin, um, those extended release products generally are, are quite expensive. So it's another thing to consider with cost. Be careful with those acetaminophen combos. And of course, um, oxycodone, everyone knows that name in the general public, and that's usually not good when it comes to drugs because of its high abuse potential and um, the fact that um, there's been so much abuse around oxycodone uh, throughout the last probably decade or so or even more. So that's um, something we'll talk about a little bit more during um, drugs, uh, the drugs of abuse lecture that I do over the summer. But until then, um, we'll leave it at that just for now. Hydromorphone is Dilaudid. This is probably the most popular option for acute pain management. It's uh, basically a more effective morphine, the rapid onset, and you don't have any active metabolites. It's about eight times more potent than morphine. No real renal issues to worry about, not renally eliminated, and the itching is quite minimal. You have IV and PO um, immediate release products. So the IV product is probably the one that gets used more often, and that's just going to be a really uh, commonly used um, post-op pain management strategy is IV hydromorphone. There's also a long-acting product that's rarely used, but I figured I'd throw it in there just for completeness sake. And then when you have an inpatient on it, a lot of times what you'll use is a PCA, which is um, patient-controlled analgesia, which I have right here. Um, essentially what this is is a pump that's, um, you've got this syringe of hydromorphone, or you can have other things too. You can have morphine or fentanyl, PCA, stuff like that. But um, it's basically in this pump, and this pump is locked up so the patient can't go in there and like, you know, squirt all the stuff in or something, tamper with it. Um, but it's locked, the controls are locked. And so when somebody's on a PCA, what's going to happen is they have this little button they can press. And that can give them a bolus dose. There's usually a continuous infusion that's set at a specific rate. The patient can deliver bolus dosing on demand. Um, they get locked out, so you can't just like keep pressing your button. You can do it every so often, depending on how the pump's set. And there's a max dose for 24 hours. So if you hit your max, you won't be able to press your button anymore. Um, PCAs, uh, because they have so many parameters you can set and how many restrictions you can have, have actually have been proven to be really effective pain management strategies. Patients on PCAs use less opioids overall, and they have much better pain control, believe it or not. Oh, fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl is a purely synthetic opioid. It's extremely potent. It doesn't have any metabolites or renal elimination. Um, dosage forms, it's, it has no FDA-approved oral form. It's mostly used for IV and transdermal. Um, if you're wondering, if you remember Prince's uh, unfortunate overdose, uh, he was thought, as I guess, public, publicized that he took fentanyl orally, which I thought was interesting, because I don't know how you get fentanyl orally. So some kind of in, interesting um, illicit uh, acquisition of some kind there. Um, but if fentanyl doesn't actually have an oral um, approved dose, so you can't get that in the US. So, And the reason why is fentanyl is really poorly bioavailable orally. Now, if you took enough fentanyl, I suppose it's going to absorb. but um, And it's a really potent opioid, so you only need a little bit, and a little bit's going to go a long way. So it's not surprising that people are overdosing from fentanyl, either from oral forms or because um, drug company, drug companies, uh, drug cartels are mixing um, fentanyl in and, and marketing it as heroin. And so people are taking fentanyl and, and overdosing that way because it's so much more 
potent than heroin. It's very difficult to, um, if you're using raw fentanyl as an ingredient, I imagine if I was a drug, you know, cartel cutting my product, that it's going to be very difficult to um, control how much dose when you're talking about micrograms of differences versus milligrams. So again, fentanyl is really potent. Um, we use it IV and transdermal. Um, it's got a fairly fast on and offset. It's a really popular option for sedation, like for ICU patients on ventilators. Um, and again, it doesn't cause much hypotension, so that's a good one, good option there. We're gonna, we'll talk about sedation during the summer a little bit more during a critical care module, but uh, for the time being, you can just know that it's it's a commonly used sedative. Um, anesthesia uses this a lot during uh, cases uh, for procedures and things like that, in conjunction with some other agents. I put this silly picture here. Somebody obviously photoshopped this, and <laughs> uh, but. I thought it was kind of funny. Um, so it comes as a, a lollipop called Actique, which is actually um, like kind of what it, it, it's, this is the product, actually. This is what it looks like. So it's like this little sucker on the end. And you basically take the fentanyl. There's fentanyl in the sucker and you cheek it for a certain amount of time and it absorbs bucally. And so that's a it's a way for um, a lot of times like cancer patients will use something like that. Uh, it's not super popular, common, but it is something that uh, is available. And I think it was invented at the University of Minnesota, believe it or not. All right, no itching really with fentanyl. Um, very, very sedating. Again, it's extremely sedating. You can use fentanyl for acute analgesia. And actually I have some providers that I work with in the ED that really like it for this purpose because it doesn't have the kidney issues. It doesn't cause itching. And if you give really small doses of it, it's not super sedating. It's just, you're just going to cross that analgesic threshold. So that's the thing with any opioid. It's all about what type of dose you're giving and how much you're giving. If you give a small amount of something that's more potent, you can equalize it to a higher amount of a less potent drug, right? So it just depends on how much you're giving. So don't be afraid to use fentanyl. Like again, some of my providers really like it as opposed to hydromorphone for like acute pain. You know, somebody breaks their arm, comes into the ED, um, you know, giving them a little bit of uh, an opioid is probably indicated. So a little bit of Dilaudid or uh, hydromorphone, excuse me, or uh, fentanyl. So um, those are really common options I see. Uh, I have had this come up occasionally, not the buccal preparation. No one's actually ever asked me about that in my career, but um, the transdermal uh, patch. Fentanyl patches are a, a nice option for chronic pain patients who need high doses of opioids to manage their pain. Um, they can put on a patch every three days and then take it off and put on a new one. It's a lot easier than taking a lot of tablets for some of these patients. So great, uh, great option for, again, those chronic cancer patients who have extremely uh, horrible pain syndromes going on um, and we want to be compassionate to their needs and provide them with analgesic relief if we can. Uh, but I have had providers ask me if they could prescribe a fentanyl patch for somebody for like initial pain like oh this person's going to need to follow up with a pain clinic or ortho or something like that can I give them a fentanyl patch? Answer is no. Uh, fentanyl patches are only for people who have been established on opioid oral regimens for a long time. It's just too dangerous, even at a low dose patch rate, um, to put a patch on somebody because you create a depot effect. The drug's basically in their skin and it's absorbing and you end up with um, it being very difficult to control unless you know exactly how many how many like milligrams of morphine equivalents. And we'll talk about uh, conversions and all that kind of stuff in uh, a little bit here. But the point is, is um, naive patients, first time opioid users, um, if you're just looking for acute pain, you're going to go oral. You're never going to go with a transdermal patch. And here's a quick slide just showing how the patches work. They're a clear patch. Um, you can apply them on chest, upper back, side, and arm. Just like any patch, there's a reservoir of medication that uh, diffuses across a membrane. And that creates a depot effect in the uh, subcutaneous tissues which and the muscle as well, which ultimately kind of slowly absorbs into the body. Um, fentanyl patches just really quickly, these are can be super dangerous if like a pet or a child for some reason gets a hold of them and like sucks on it or puts it in their mouth. There's a lot of medication in this. If you consider... Um, 75 micrograms per hour designed to deliver over a 72 hour interval. That's a lot of drug. And, you know, if we give somebody an acute dose of fentanyl in like the emergency department, they might get 50, 100 micrograms <clears throat> IV. So 
that's again quite a bit of medication potentially. So just in case you're ever um, working with chronic uh, cancer patients or chronic pain patients, or um, you have relatives or family members who are on fentanyl, make sure they're disposing it of appropri appropriately. And the point is, you don't just throw it in the trash. You don't want somebody to be able to get their hands on it because even the the patch that's been used still contains some drug in it and can be heavily uh, uh, toxic to um, somebody if they get their hands on it or if they for some reason ingest it or try to eat it. There's a lot of other fentanyls on the market that I'm not going to talk about. They're basic. Well, I'm going to talk about them, but I'm not going to test you on them. Uh, they're basically used for procedural areas. So um, like L-fentanyl, for example, they use during ophthalmic procedures for some reason. I don't know why. I don't work in that area, but I know that <clears throat> we do some work um, with our neighbors, Philip, Philip's Eye Institute, and they use L-fentanyl. Um, Remy is the, the drug. Remy fentanyl is a product that causes a little bit, from what I understand, it puts people in a bit of a deeper sedation. It's more common for anesthesia to use during procedures like um, uh, specific spine surgeries and things like that where they really want deep level sedation. So, And there's like these ultra super fentanyls that are really potent that are mostly just, um, I don't know what they're used for, not, not in medicine, <laughs> maybe for like elephant tranquilizers, stuff like that, and um, advanced veterinary medicine. Uh, and then opioid onsets, in case you want to compare. So here's here's our old standard morphine. Um, so this is minutes. You give somebody a bolus injection. Morphine takes a while to kind of build up to your, your full effect. You compare that to hydromorphone, much faster. Compare that to fentanyl, even faster yet, with a much faster offset. Fentanyl's short acting. And then you got other things that are kind of all over the gamut. So just so you can see like how stuff is used and how we dose things and why we might pick one over the other um, and how the onset might affect. Stuff with really fast onsets, because it's going to cause such a potent um, agonic, um, what am I trying to say, stimulation of the mu receptors at, all at once, it's going to cause a very heavy sedative component. So like Remy and L-fentanyl and fentanyl can be much more sedating, something like morphine. Um, a paridine or demerol, uh, just very quickly, it has no role in pain management, uh, but it is an opioid that we use currently for treatment of rigors at low doses. So somebody's having shivering. This is common with um, different anesth anesthetic use. So in post-op, um, you might see meparidine used fairly often. Otherwise, we don't see it used very frequently. It was a commonly used um, analgesic medication for quite a long time, but it has a toxic metabolite that causes seizures. It's also renally eliminated, so it builds up. It also has a number of other issues with it. We don't use it other than very small doses for rigors, and that's usually in the post-operative period only. Methadone. Uh, methadone uh, has the longest half-life for a non-extended release opioid. It's about 24 hours. Its um, analgesic duration is short at first, but as the patient continues to use it, will increase. Uh, methadone is an interesting drug because most people probably think of methadone. They think of like opioid abuse. So like I've got this picture here of what a methadone clinic might look like. People come in, they take their dose from, uh, you know, a nurse or somebody is manning the counter. They watch the patient consume it all and uh, they come in every day. Um, maybe they get like a week or two of take home doses for patients who are stable and long term. But it's mostly used. Um, commonly for uh, opioid addiction maintenance for people who have gotten off whatever opioid they were addicted to and are now you know, using this as a maintenance medication. However, methadone is something that has um, some unique roles in pain management that I think maybe be under, are underutilized. Like I think methadone actually has some good evidence for being used for acute pain management and also um, as a chronic agent as well. But we just don't use it very often uh, for a few different reasons, but methadone doesn't just have a mu only uh, mechanism. It also has something called NMDA antagonistic properties. So it can have a bit of a dissociative effect. It can also have effects on serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibition, which is the way that most of our common antidepressants work as well. So it has some other effects. And also pretty much every medication that works for neuropathic pain uses some sort of a serotonin, norepinephrine uh, mechanism as well. So it has some other mechanisms that might make it more, have greater utility in other pain syndromes. However, I just don't think it's really useful, used a lot. Um, it's cheap, it's effective. I don't, again, I think that we could probably use methadone in place of certain other opioids in different places, but we, we don't. Um, 
So anyway, that's just my opinion. Um, roles in treating opioid dependence, I talked about that, but um, know that there are prescribing restrictions. I think that might be a reason why people are hesitant to prescribe methadone for any other reason, because they're like, oh, I can't prescribe methadone because I don't treat uh, addiction medicine or I don't have that specific DEA license. It's like, well, yeah, you, you can't do it for that, but you can prescribe it for pain still. That's still legal. Uh, methadone is known to prolong QTC interval and it's okay in pregnancy. So the question you might have is why do we give methadone for opioid dependence? Well, methadone um, doesn't create quite as much of a euphoric effect. In fact, it doesn't really have much of a euphoric effect unless you take a lot of it. And so if you give somebody methadone, um, they get that uh, mu agonizing effect, um, agonist effect, I should say not agonizing, <laughs> that mu agonist effect. All right, let's try that again. Uh, the mu agonist effect without the euphoric effect. Therefore, methadone has become, um, well, wasn't one of the earliest ways that we were successfully able to treat people who had opioid dependence issues with something that would supplement the body's physical dependence on the opioid itself without having that strong euphoric component that you'd get from something like injecting heroin. Uh, so that's why it's been used for a long time. We're kind of switching to a different drug called buprenorphine now, but methadone clinics are still going to be around for quite a while, I would imagine, and can be a, a relatively popular choice for people who are long-term uh, opioid dependent. Oh, dose conversions and comparisons. So this is where everyone gets a little scared. I'm just going to say this now. I'll have some practice problems, and next week we actually don't have a specific lecture. It's sort of an open week because of MLK Day. And uh, you can use that as a chance to practice some of your conversions if you want. But the I think that converting, whoops, excuse me, I think that converting opioids is a really important thing for any healthcare provider. Anyone who's prescribing opioids should know how to do this to some degree. And uh, it's not that you're going to have to do it on a regular basis, but you should know the basics on how it is done, especially if you're ever changing somebody from an IV regimen to an oral regimen or whatnot. You don't always have pharmacists to do this, and in fact, you might not have a pharmacist that's involved with this at all. Um, so being able to do this is, I think, an important skill, or at least to know how to do this is an important skill. So what I would say is the basics behind this is that you take whatever the person's on. So let's say somebody's inpatient and they're getting IV hydromorphone, you're going to discharge them and you want them on an oral oxycodone regimen. So the way to do that is generally you're going to take the hydromorphone IV and look at their total daily dose they're on. You're going to convert that into, um, you can convert it sometimes directly into oxycodone, but if you don't have a conversion, you can convert everything into morphine equivalents and then convert the morphine equivalents to the oxycodone. So morphine to oxycodone is pretty easy. It's like a two to, uh, like a two to three type ratio. So anyway, I'll go through some calculations, but I just wanted to post this on here as far as dose. Uh, equivalence. And it's not always exactly one to one, like we don't always know exactly what you know it would be, but there's sometimes ranges here or there that it's about this. So there's some fluctuation built in or some um some wiggle room built into those calculations. Then for fentanyl patches, you do have to convert everything to your oral 24 hour morphine dose. So you take whatever opioids they're on, figure out how much oral morphine that is, and then that will give you what fentanyl patch to prescribe that patient. Uh, to pentadol, continuing on our opioid journey here, we have a few slides left, and these are all sort of odd opioids. Pentadol, I'm not going to talk much about. It's very uh, seldom used. Really, its marketing was all about being an opioid that has better GI side effects, which I I don't know. It doesn't really get used all that much. So whether that's true or not, probably doesn't matter because it's expensive. So people don't really use Nucenta all that much. Buprenorphine is a mu partial agonist, so it doesn't elicit your full response, but has competitive uh, antagonism as well. Also some weak kappa antagonism. Um, some people do use buprenorphine for pain management, but it's more commonly used in combination with naloxone, which we'll talk about here in a second, um, as the drug suboxone. So suboxone is commonly given as a opioid dependence medication in lieu of methadone. Um, and uh, it's usually given as like this little film that people take um, sublingually. 
Uh, I haven't talked about this directly, but I suppose this is a good time as any. I might as well continue my thought here. Um, buprenorphine it, or Suboxone is uh, has become a pretty well favored replacement for methadone, in the sense that you don't have to go to clinics to get Suboxone. Uh, methadone has a lot of prescribing restrictions around it. Suboxone you can get at like a CVS, um, so there's a lot less stigma associated with opioid dependence if you're taking Suboxone, and you could just go pick it up at your regular pharmacy with other medications you pick up. Um, it's also been shown specific, and whether that's the only reason or not, or it's actually a more effective option for patients, I don't know. But there has been studies showing, especially in younger patients, that people do well better on Suboxone regimens than they do on methadone regimens as far as relapse rates and things like that go. So certainly an option that is getting uh, more popularity. And I think as newer patients are identified with opioid dependence, they probably go directly to Suboxone. Um, I think methadone is probably going to be the maintenance regimen for people it's worked well for, but I imagine that type of strategy will fade as Suboxone becomes, and as is it's becoming more, more and more popular. Um, opioids suppress the cough reflex, so as far as cough suppressants go, they are useful for this um, somewhat. Some people will argue they don't do anything at all and that nothing really suppresses cough, which is maybe true. But um, codeine, cough syrup combination products are really popular. Codeine plus or minus dextromethorphan is popular. Codeine plus or minus guafenicin, which is an expectorant. Sorry, they don't combine codeine with dextromethorphan. It's usually codeine with uh, guafenicin, which is Robitussin AC, um, which is over-the-counter in some states, a codeine product over-the-counter. Codeine is one of the most like abused substances in the country right now. If you've ever listened to any like um, modern uh, pop song, they... You know, how many references to codeine can you count in like a, you know, a 10 song playlist? Probably a few at least. Uh, and actually my, uh, my boss's uh, neighbor, I guess, weird connection here. He works for the DEA and was saying that codeine is one of the, the biggest ones that they, they monitor the trafficking on, which is just really bizarre to me because codeine doesn't really have a lot of potency to it. It's about one tenth the potency of morphine. I consider it like a, a barely even an opioid at all. Um, but I suppose if you drink a lot of it, you know, you, you get some effect from it, I guess. And then if you combine it with promethazine, you're getting like a psych antipsychotic psychoactive effect as well. Uh, so there's maybe that to, to consider. But coding by itself, I don't, I don't really understand the draw to it. Maybe because it is so weak, people can drink a lot of it or take a lot of it without feeling like they're having a, an effect. And maybe it doesn't have as much of a risk of overdose, but certainly there's been episodes in, in the news and recent things where people have been having codeine related overdoses or codeine combination product overdoses so certainly an issue the one thing i would have you uh, think about is this product called t3 or tylenol 3 which is codeine combined with acetaminophen it's 30 millig uh, yeah 30 milligrams codeine uh, 300 milligrams acetaminophen it's a very weak analgesic option but a lot of times people will prescribe this to somebody who is maybe adamant that they want something stronger than ibuprofen and you're like well i don't really want to prescribe them a real opioid but i'll give them some tylenol 3 with tylenol with codeine and then that, that's not really a real opioid in your mind but yeah it's probably not going to do a whole lot for that patient as far as pain goes but it might satisfy um you know their their desire maybe it's it's like a compromise approach right the patient feels like they're winning because they got something quote unquote better than ibuprofen even though Analgesic wise, it's probably worse. Um, and then you feel like you're actually, you know, giving the patient something that isn't going to make them addicted in the long run. So anyway, um, dextromethorphan, over the counter cough suppressant, really common in things like Robitussin and Delsum. It's not an opioid, but it has a similar structure that mimics codeine and is designed as a cough suppressant. Um, you can drink, if you drink a ton of this, you do get sort of a psychoactive effect, but it's not really an opioid-like effect. It's more of a hallucinogenic. So you can abuse it, but it's not as common. It's, I, I put the robot here. I think, apparently people call it robo-tripping, which I think is kind of a funny name. Um, <laughs> uh, cough suppressants in general, um, just as a, as a kind of final thought about cough suppressants, there's not really any evidence that says that cough suppressants do anything. So treating somebody's cough with codeine or dextromethorphan or whatever um, the odds of it helping are, are pretty slim to none. Uh, so uh, opioids constipate. So using them for as antidiarrheal agents, you've got Lamotol and Loperamide. Um, Lamotol is a uh, prescription product. It's combined with atropine. The reason it's combined with atropine is to discourage people from injecting it because apparently if you're a drug abuser and you want to 
inject um, diphenoxalate, you would know that atropine is anticholinergic, and then if you did that, you'd feel really uncomfortable. <laughs> okay, that's a stretch. I, again, I don't know who makes this stuff up, but um, Momodal is a prescription product for diarrhea. It's more for severe diarrhea, um, and that's that's where people are going to take it. Well, Paramide or Imodium is the brand name of that. It's over-the-counter. It's not absorbed systemically. It just works in the GI tract, so there should be theoretically no risk of having any opioid-related effects whatsoever. It should just simply um, cause some constipation, which is what you want in that situation. Okay, a couple other things quick. Opioid-induced hyperalgesia is increase in pain sensitivity following exposure to opioids, usually with very high doses. It's very well documented in animals, and there's some decent evidence in humans as well. Um, you can treat it with NMDA antagonists, so ketamine um, is an option for this. So NMDA antagonists, what this concept is, it's like the NMDA receptors have to do with how your body processes information between the central nervous system and the way your body perceives basically your surroundings is how kind of I understand these receptors, although it's a little bit nebulous. But the dissociative effects they can have is um, to prevent this process from occurring consistently, which can help with pain. It can help with other things as well. And in this case, it seems to help as uh, pain management and also to sort of reset what's going on with the opioids um, and their sensitivity uh, being overstimulated. So it's a weird phenomenon. It's not really common. Um, sometimes you do see an opioid addict during withdrawal as well. Um, brief high doses of fentanyl and remifentanyl associated with increased pain and opioid requirements postoperatively. That's where they're seeing more case reports in those post-op patients um, and then using ketamine uh, as an alternative to an opioid in the post-op setting for pain management. Okay, let's flip gears a little bit and talk about naloxone. Naloxone is an opioid antagonist. It's a peer antagonist that competes with and replaces opioids at the site of action. Theoretically, if you gave naloxone to somebody without opioids in their system, it should do absolutely nothing. Um, it comes in a bunch of different uh, uh, delivery mechanisms, but it's not absorbed orally, which, you know, in this case, it's usually used as a rescue medication, so you don't really need an oral use for it anyway. Onsets minutes, it lasts about 30 to 120 minutes. So that's important. Like if somebody is um, overdosed on a narcotic opioid and you give them an IV dose of naloxone, that by the time that naloxone wears off, that opioid could very well still be in their system because it hasn't fully eliminated yet. So know that it's a relatively short window of opportunity you get. So you're going to have to redose patients. Or you could start, sometimes people get on naloxone drips as well, where they get continuous infusions to prevent that from happening. Like if they ingested like a really long acting medication, like maybe they overdosed orally on a bunch of oxycodone extended release or something like that. Um, giving somebody naloxone can precipitate immediate withdrawal. So if somebody is um, a chronic opioid user or they are actively in a euphoric state but they're having trouble breathing and you give them naloxone, they, people can be violent and agitated on that. So just make sure that it's uh, appropriate and you're giving a smaller dose if the patient isn't critically ill. If they're critically ill, if they're dying because they can't breathe, give them a big dose because you want to save their life. But otherwise... Um, be careful with how much you give. Um, opioid kits are getting uh, to be popular in the community. Um, we dispense them out of our emergency department. Essentially what it is is it's a naloxone, uh, so I think I said opioid kit, <laughs> naloxone kit. Um, basically it's a naloxone vial with some syringes and needles in it um, that allows a family member to have keep on them if they have you know somebody in their household that has used before or has overdosed before, so they have that risk. Or if they can give it to a friend or a family member, even if it's you know, a group of people who uh, use drugs together, they can at least prevent that um, emergency department visit <clears throat> or that, um, that possible death from overdose because uh, they have access to something like that. So these are commonly uh, dispensed from ERs. I think pharmacies are dispensing them now. I think police are carrying them with them. So there's a lot of different applications for these naloxone kits. Naltrexone is like a longer acting version of naloxone that's not used in acute cases. Um, you give it, up, it can have up to 72 hours depending on dose for oral. Um, otherwise you can give it IM and it lasts for up to four weeks. So what that's used is opioid dependence. 
Um, and actually, sometimes they use it for alcohol dependence too. But basically, the idea is it blocks your mu receptors for four weeks. So if you were to give somebody a naltrexone injection and they went and used heroin, they wouldn't be able to really get a high off of that. Um, and also, alcohol tends to seemingly roundabout stimulate the mu receptors as well via kind of the body's natural pleasure reward system. And so you end up with sort of a similar pathway there. And so people who um, take a uh, opioid or, take, or drink alcohol seem to actually get some response from these uh, those receptors being blocked as well. So interestingly enough, has some applications to addiction medicine. Um, shouldn't really do anything if you're opioid naive, just like naloxone. And again, precipitating withdrawal is the major issue here. Um, specific antagonist, nalbufene, is a mu partial agonist. It can be used for pain management, but also often, most commonly, what I see this used for is opioid-induced itching in obstetrics patients, especially people who have um, had epidurals. It's just really common. Not commonly used, but commonly like put on order sets and things like that. Epidurals for obstetrics are usually fentanyl, so there's not a whole lot of itching involved anyway. Uh, methyl naltrexone or Relistor is a newer drug that's designed as a peripherally acting mu agonist, and the purpose of this is for opioid-induced constipation. So where this drug is going to come into play is for patients on chronic opioid use, like a cancer patient who takes you know large amounts of fentanyl a day or oxycodone a day, and they are getting um, this shot if they don't have a bowel movement within a certain amount of time. It actually works pretty quickly, about with one, one hour. It's actually one of the only drugs out there that's really a surefire way to be able to give somebody um, relief from const opioid induced constipation in a fairly quick time frame. It's kind of expensive, but not not compared to you know the grand scheme of things and the quality of life the patient's going to get because of this. So it's actually a pretty decent drug to have, especially for chronic pain patients. Okay, let's talk about um, some strategies and some other things quickly here. I know this lecture is really long, and I apologize for that. Hopefully you can break it up if you need to and go back and review pieces if you have to as well. Uh, but a chronic pain strategy, so again, let's use like a cancer patient. Other diseases may have chronic pain as well too, but let's talk about cancer. So what you want to do is assess the daily pain medication use. If they're using a lot of their short-acting medication, consider starting a long-acting agent. So let's say you start somebody on a pain regimen and you prescribe them as needed plain oxycodone 5 milligram. It turns out they're taking their daily recommended and even more than that. They're taking more than what you prescribed them per day. Okay, well, let's assess their pain and see if, you know, it's a pain issue or maybe it's an abuse issue. There could be either one of those. Um, if it's a pain issue, you want to consider starting maybe a long-acting agent. So look at how much they're taking totally. Um, you want, generally want to convert their total dose into morphine equivalents and then look at what long-acting agent you could start. The three common ones are going to be your fentanyl patches, <clears throat> morphine-controlled release, and oxycodone extended release. Patients um, should also have something at breakthrough pain as well. So even if you prescribe them a long acting option, you're going to want to give them a short acting option for breakthrough pain as well. So you always wanna have something immediate release available for breakthrough pain regardless of your long acting dose. Um, so like plain Percocet or oxycodone acetaminophen, plain oxycodone, plain hydrocodone acetaminophen, those are all fine options. Um, there is something called cross-tolerance when switching opioids. So let's say somebody's on hydromorphone and you want to switch them to oxycodone. Usually once you figure out their total daily dose and that conversion, you decrease it by 25%. And then you would give them that. Because you figure they're going to get some benefit simply from having a new drug on board. You don't have to go exactly one-to-one. -one. Withdrawal. So withdrawal from opioids usually occurs three weeks after daily use. Uh, severity depends on, uh, obviously, hopefully, uh, on the drug, dose, and length of use. The more, the more length, the more dose, you're going to have uh, poorer symptoms. Um, so three to four hours after your last dose, usually having craving, anxiety, fear of withdrawal, eight to 14 hours, restlessness, insomnia, one to three days, tremor, muscle spasms, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, Extremely uncomfortable and anxiety-inducing to be an opioid withdrawal. However, it's rarely fatal, and it's only going to be fatal in people if they're like malnourished or um, severely frail people to begin with. Otherwise, you, you don't generally die from opioid withdrawal, although you might feel like you're dying at a certain point. Um, you aren't actually at risk of dying. You can treat withdrawal with any opioid, although, however, we're using methadone and buprenorphine, naloxone, which is suboxone. Um, antagonists such as or drugs like clonidine, um, benzodiazepines, antiemetics are all used as well to kind of mitigate some of the symptoms, but to varying degrees of success. 
We manage side effects. Itching, we use antihistamine, so diphenhydramine and hydroxazine, and the partial agonist malbufene are options. Hydroxazine is probably the most common one. It's least sedating. Um, constipation, bowel regimen required, just like I said. Drugs we're going to talk about during uh, bowel. I won't test you on these for this exam, uh, but Senna, Docusate, those types of drugs, and then methyl naltrexone, what we talked about as well for those patients. Um, addiction is, uh, I went to a, a good talk on addiction uh, medicine uh, a couple of years ago, and this, this stat that I said earlier, I'll always kind of stick in my head, is like, it's like a 3 to 5% of patients who take opioids are at risk for addiction. And again, it's like you look at it like it's a severe side effect uh, from a medication. How would you approach any other medication with a severe side effect? Like if you give somebody insulin and their blood sugar becomes extremely hypoglycemic, if you give somebody warfarin and they get a bleeding risk, it's the same type of discussion you have. So talking about addiction with people, people who have a history of substance abuse or have a family history of addiction. Um, some people might not even want to touch it because they don't even want to risk addicting themselves. And that that's okay too. So having those conversations with patients is really important. There's a lot of challenging challenges with prescribing and dispensing. Um, patients might be trying to obtain product in order to sell it. Um, so there's a street value, there's doctor shopping. Um, one thing you can do is look at the Minnesota Prescription Monitoring Program, which any provider can sign up for, and pharmacists can as well. And you can log in and, and you can type, basically it's just a name, date of birth search, and see where people have been prescribing medications and where people have been filling them as well. And that should give you a snapshot into if the patient is, you know, filling the same thing every month um, with the same doctor and picking up at the same pharmacy, or if they've shopped 10 doctors and 10 pharmacies in the last month. Um, it is up to you, I think. Uh, it's, well, it's up to all of us, I should say. But um, take this kind of stuff seriously. Don't feel like um, you have to be guilty about looking into somebody's history. And trust your instincts. If you feel like somebody is trying to get medication out of you and maybe they they don't seem like they're being completely genuine or you just you just want to double check, it's worth it um, because, you know, prescribers and pharmacists who dispense the medications, you know, we're all liable for those um those situations where people are abusing the system and so to make sure that we're doing our due diligence to to research that instead of just you know blatantly prescribing the medication or dispensing the medication um, PO abuse and addiction is definitely linked to IV drug abuse why people who get addicted to things like oxycodone it's hard to obtain this stuff um, on the street as readily as you can obtain an illegal drug like heroin. Um, heroin flows into the Twin Cities from cartels uh, straight up from Mexico, and it's uh, relatively easy to get, and it's relatively cheap compared to trying to obtain an oxycodone tablet <clears throat> illicitly, illegally. So, or going to 20 different doctors to try and get enough to, 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 to uh, sustain your addiction. So certainly um, the rise of um, the opioid crisis is is heavily linked to PO abuse and addiction that, that kind of all stems from the same place. So that's that. Um, some other things to talk about really quickly. Tramadol. Tramadol is kind of an opioid. It has some really weak mu activity. It inhibits reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine in the CNS. We talked about that mechanism already, similar to antidepressants. It's oral only, regular and extended release options, usually dosed every eight hours, <clears throat> as needed medication commonly. We rarely ever use this scheduled. It's mostly as a PRN. I kind of consider it in the weak opioid bucket along with codeine. Like if you don't want to give a full opioid, but you want to give something different than an NSAID, Tramadol. Um, tramadol actually is newly a controlled substance. It wasn't for a long time, but it got a controlled status after quite a few people lobbied for it to do. People were abusing it for sure, so it makes sense. It's often used in conjunction with NSAIDs to avoid starting your actual opioid, and it does have some renal dosing restrictions on it as well. Lidocaine patches, mostly for neuropathic pain, uh, but it is a good option that sort of numbs the area. You can apply up to three patches and you can cut them to fit certain areas. So just another thing to think about in your arsenal for uh, prescribing pain medications. It's a topical product. You won't want to leave it on for more than 12 hours. It, you can get systemic exposure to lidocaine if you wear it continuously, so people just have to remember to take it off. And then really quickly, neuropathic pain. Um, neuropathic pain can manifest from a lot of different sources, diabetic neuropathy, post-herpetic neurologia, spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, and there's some other ones as well. The treatment usually use non-traditional agents. We try to avoid opioids if we can. Opioids would work for um, 
neuropathic pain, but they really aren't the primary uh, treatment option we would we would we would want in a patient. Um, so the sensation is different than nociceptive pain, so pins and needles, burning, tingling sensations. Um, drugs, we haven't really talked about these yet, so that's why I'm not going to cover this a lot, and I'm not going to test you on neuropathic pain this time around. Um, but uh, there's a lot of anti-epileptic drugs that are used for neuropathic pain, gabapentin, pregabalin, carbamazepine, um, uh, antidepressants, older antidepressants such as tricyclic drugs, nortriptyline, amitriptyline are used for this, and then serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors like Cymbalta are used uh, for neuropathic pain. Those are kind of your first line options. So very different from the other pain management options we talked about today, but still um, something relevant uh, to our discussion. So again, we'll talk about this. When we talk about the drugs during psych and, and um, epilepsy, I'll revisit that a little bit and talk about their different indications, but I'm not going to test you on neuropathic pain for this particular module. So that's that for that lecture. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Next week, I'm going to give you guys some information on use, uh, doing opioid conversions and some practice problems. If you do the practice problems that I give you, there will be practice problems on the exam as well, which makes people nervous. But if you, the ones on the exam will be very, very similar to the ones I give you. So if you can do the ones I give you, you can do the ones on the exam. I rarely have people miss them. They should be free points, although they are a little nerve wracking for some. But we'll walk through that uh, calculation and we'll walk through those uh, practice problems. So um, that's coming soon. But uh, with that, that's the week's lecture. And thanks for listening.